If you have a Bible, open it with me to the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, where we have been for a while and we will be for a while. (laughs) And I want to start this morning with a question, and yeah, we could do a show of hands. Have you murdered anyone this week? (laughs) Not yet. (laughs) It's early in the week. Well, I didn't see any hands, so let's close in prayer because there's nothing else for us to cover this morning. (laughs) Or is there? (laughs) There's a meaning behind our words, isn't there? While it might look like one thing on the surface, something simple, something direct, especially when it applies to Scripture, There's great value in getting at the context, in the content of what's being said. We're going to be talking about that this morning as we look at murder, as we look at what Jesus has to say about it, and as we unpack it, and as we sort of peel the onion layer by layer and look at this thing. So the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they were very proficient at reflecting an outward appearance of what looked very spiritual. They had the robes. They had, you know, the, 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 the vestments and all. All of the, the uh, different things they did, ceremonies and rituals and all of that. Very spiritual. Very spiritual. <laughs> However, below the surface, something entirely different was going on. Uh, Their whole thing was about outward conformity. That's what religion does. Yet, as we'll see today and in the weeks to come, Jesus is very, he has very little interest in outward conformity because it always comes to not conformity, but transformation of the human heart. That's where he's working. So we talked last week about how the scribes and the Pharisees, they'd taken these Ten Commandments, the core of the law of Moses, and interpreted, reinterpreted, embellished them to now there were 613 laws or points of outward conformity. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. All of them. Points which no one would be required, no one would be able to keep, no one would be able to follow perfectly, of course, Uh, but they were required to follow in order, in their minds anyway, to obtain righteousness. Righteousness, again, very important we understand that word, right standing before God. They understood it insofar as righteousness is an essential ingredient as far as being able to get to heaven. You've got to have it. Because man is sinful, cannot come into God's presence without it, However, they, as well as many religious organizations and isms down through the centuries, (laughs) have concluded that man can make his own. I'm going to make my own righteousness. And folks, truly, after all, legalism, it's a term that, that refers to the idea that a person earns righteousness by obeying the rules or doing good works. It appeals to the natural man, to the natural woman, We want to believe, uh, you know, one of the terms I love is that we want to believe that we're checking all the right boxes. So here's Jesus, this rabbi from the Galilee, the northern region of Israel, the the low-life blue-collar region, that's how that was looked upon by the people in the south in Jerusalem, standing on a mountain one day, teaching the Jewish people who would have been very well aware of these things, that their righteous acts would not, could not, could never be enough. What a shock. We finished with verse 20 last week, uh, and that's where we're going to pick it up again this morning for the sake of the context of the passage. (laughs) I love to say, a a, a text without a context is a con. You've got to be really careful to observe the context, uh, see where it leads us. 
So verse 20, he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means, that's pretty, pretty definite, enter the kingdom of heaven. You mean all that stuff I've been doing all my life? Yeah, that stuff. We looked at this last week. If you base your relationship with God upon what you do for him, you'll never be able to do enough. Very simple. You can't perform enough righteous acts. You can't keep enough rules. You can't be religious enough to satisfy God's holy requirement of utter perfection in coming to him. And that's true. That's taught throughout the New Testament. It will always, underscore always, come down to acknowledging one's helpless state and recognizing what God has done for you. And anything emanating from my life is a response to that recognition, a response to the grace that I've been shown. So now beginning in verse 21, we're going to see a series of six contrasting statements through which Jesus will expose the false teaching of the religious establishment of his day. And by the way, these expose the false teaching of religious establishments in our day. In these statements, he'll contrast the letter of the law of Moses. Remember last week, he said, I didn't come to abolish that law, I came to fulfill it. Because they had embellished, they had stripped it of its context so often, he's going to contrast that with the spirit in which God intended it to be understood. So Jesus will both give, remember we talked about there's two purposes here. He's going to give powerful instruction as far as he will unmask the false teachings of the scribes and Pharisees as he does this. And while these teachings would make him immensely popular with the common people, they would set the religious establishment on edge. And they would cement their hatred for him. That's what the truth does so often. So he will reveal the fallacy of the Pharisees, but he will also teach his people. Verse 21, you've heard it said that, to those, uh, to, that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Once again, have you murdered anyone lately? <laughs> Desi, you're looking like maybe you have. <laughs> I looked at Desiree, her eyes were that big. It's like, (laughs) let's be honest. Most of us, all of us, when we hear that, we think, I would never do that. And the point here is, and we have to be careful about that, because that was the exact same attitude that the Pharisees had here in Matthew chapter 5. I would never do that. Uh, truly, it's a remarkable statement because the Pharisees would be thinking, we're the keepers of the law. We're the ones who are the protectors of the law. We're the preservers of the law. We're the ones that are doing it all. Jesus, what are you talking about? So here in Matthew chapter 5, in verses 21 and following, Jesus gives these six crucial illustrations about how these law keepers how these Pharisees had fallen woefully short of God's intent with that law, the law of Moses. Because Jesus says here, look, you need to understand that until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter of my word is invalid, even the smallest stroke. Uh, My words are going to last until heaven and earth pass away. And what you have done, Pharisees, You've rewritten my law. You've lowered the standard. You've abolished my law, in effect. So I've come to put that standard back where it needs to be. That's why Jesus gives these six illustrations, all beginning with the same similar phrase, you have, been, you have heard that it was said by the ancients of old. So what does he mean by that? Centuries before, there had been famous rabbis, famous interpreters of the law, Uh, who were called fathers of antiquity in their day, men of long ago. And I believe that that's the best uh, thing that we can interpret this by, is is that that's what Jesus is referring to. It fits the context. What it is is a designation related to their oral teaching that glossed over 
the true law of God as they added their own thoughts to the teachings of the rabbis. So over time, because it was embellished time and again, it no longer carried the essence of the truth of God's word. We see that in our day as people make a little change here, a little change there. Pretty soon, it's gone. So when Jesus came, he didn't contradict his words or he didn't contradict the words of God in the Old Testament. No, remember, he's God in the flesh. <laughs> he wrote it. He, he, he was behind it. Instead, he came to contradict the rabbis' traditional interpretations of that law, which had been given to the people down through the centuries. They were hardened up with their interpretations. So I want to look at this, and we're going to break it down in three ways. I, I want to cover uh, these things here. Uh, as we look at it, we're going to look at, first, the rabbinical tradition. That's what Jesus exposes. Second, we'll look at the actual biblical teaching. That's how Jesus corrects. And finally, we're going to apply these things to our lives so we can understand how God wants to transform us, impact our thinking, transform our lives through them. So first, the rabbinical tradition. Uh, verse 21, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be in danger of the judgment. So think about it, folks. Imagine what must have been going through the minds of the Pharisees as they listen to the words of Jesus. What do you mean it, everything that I've said is wrong? They'd heard him up to that point. <laughs> Jesus says, you've heard that it was said by the men of old, you shall not murder. That's the law of Moses. But I want you to notice something with me. Their law emphasized the act. And it emphasized only the act of murder. They believed that because they had never killed someone with premeditation that they were holy. And that was what the letter of the law was producing in them. And, and, and you know, we look at our laws today. We have, we, you plan it out and you murder an innocent person. Uh, that's the word used for murder here. There are seven words in the, in, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, uh, in Hebrew, that translate kill or murder. And this specific word that, that is being used here is the one that talks about premeditated taking of a life. Make no mistake, he's not talking about something else. So uh, people try to, they try to retranslate this, <laughs> and it's very clear. They really believe that they were righteous, holy, because they never committed the act of murder. It's the superficial religiosity that Jesus attacks here in Matthew chapter 5. He said, when he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. He's going somewhere with this. Because they figured if they didn't do the act, that was righteousness. That was what part of how, what would get them in. And Jesus is saying, your righteousness has to go beyond that. It has to exceed that. That's the law. If you look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, the Sixth Commandment says, Thou shalt not murder. You shall not murder. So you say, well, that sounds right to me. That's what the text says. True. Now, Jesus comes along, quotes the law of Moses, given by God himself, you shall not murder, but... But what you've got to understand here is the traditional Jewish penalty that they had in their day fell short of the divine standard that God had laid out. Let's read on in verse 21. He says, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be in danger of the judgment. So this is legalese that Jesus is talking about here. The, the New American Standard Bible translates this more clearly. Whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. Catch the significance here. He says, you've been told this, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder is answerable to the court. And I have a question for you. Where did God say that? God never said it. They said it. That was how they were adding their interpretation to the law of God. What's the penalty for murder? Death. <laughs> you don't go to court 
You go to the stone pile. That's it. That was what, their, what the law of God said. All the way back, Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, we read, Whoever sheds man's blood, by, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. You want to make a, ca- a case for capital punishment? There it is. Their traditional penalty for murder was liability before the civil court. And apparently they, they would use <laughs> their own judgment when it came to punishment. Again, we've talked about God, God, God's not grading on a curve here. He, he had some very clear instruction. God's word, God's character was never taken into consideration by these people. Murder is it, it, a violation of the sacredness of life. God says, you're not to murder. Why? Because I'm the author of life. He speaks of the sacredness of human life. Proverbs 6 tells us that God hates those who shed innocent blood. I was appalled when I saw there was a truck advertising free abortions parked outside the Democratic National Convention a few weeks ago. Appalling. Courts are stripping away parents' rights to intervene when their children want to sign up for gender reassignment, drugs, and surgery. Folks, we have an election in just one month. And we shouldn't even, it should not even be something that we have to vote on as to whether or not it's morally right to mutilate or slaughter children. But that's what's at stake. You can't make this stuff up. When men are are calling what is good evil and calling what is evil good, just like the Bible prophesies. The point is this. The Pharisees didn't commit murder because if they did, they figured they would be in trouble with the law of the land. And that was it. They never brought God into the equation. That's religion. However, Their superficial attitude overlooked the heart of man. So the problem then, as well as now, is their answer to this issue excluded the attitude of the heart that drives murder. They neglected Psalm 51.6, God desires truth in the inward parts. In 1 Samuel 16.7, we see that man looks at the outward appearance, and yet God looks at the heart. Jesus speaks to the heart of man. That's why when they came to him and asked, what's the greatest commandment? What did he tell them? He said, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, everything that's on the inside. Because if you're loving God on the inside, what's going to come out is going to show. It will manifest on the outside. They were focused on the outside. And we'll look at that a lot more as he takes the religious leaders of his day on because this is, he's just getting started in the Sermon on the Mount. So what does Jesus say about this? Here's the biblical teaching because Jesus had to correct their error. He didn't, he wanted to, to take their rabbinical tradition and set it on its edge. He couldn't, he, he, he had to correct it. He had to turn it around. He had to bring truth to the equation. In doing so, he explains to them that in, uh, what the real true meaning of murder is. So remember, this is God speaking, saying that what you have heard up until now doesn't matter. And boy, he was not making friends with the religious leaders in those statements. He says, this is what's matter, what matters, because this is the truth. You've heard that it was said by the ancients of old, going on into verse 22, but I say to you, and he's, notice he says this with authority. You've been told, but I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. You think, well, isn't that overdoing it a bit, Jesus? No, actually it's not. Because he's getting to the heart. 
I, I, I read this and I imagine the silence in the crowd as Jesus there on the mountain speaking goes beyond murder to address its root cause. Notice, first of all, that, that the issue was what? Anger in the heart. That's what he says. Anger in the heart is the root of murder. Murder is the fruit of anger. So Jesus deals with that, which is the real issue in man, doesn't he? What's going on inside of him? You can't justify yourself because you don't murder. That's essentially what he's saying here. Because you didn't technically carry out the act, then you're okay. And he's saying, no, that's not okay because your heart has never been impacted. If there's hatred in your heart, you're the same as a murderer. I know that's a, a strong statement, but that's what he's saying here. You're guilty before the court, before the Sanhedrin. You're guilty to be burned in fiery Gehenna, he says. And hopefully, folks, as we read this, we find ourselves extremely convicted because all of us find ourselves to be guilty. Every one of us. Yeah, well, we, I would never shoot someone. I, that's not me. That's not you. But we've all become angry, haven't we? We've all mocked someone. Or we have some, we brood inside with a simmering, smoldering bitterness. Yeah. That's the human condition. So Jesus attacks the attitude of the heart. Because that's what the root of murder is. I've heard the saying once, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And I believe that's true. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. So by God's standard, outside of Christ, there is zero difference between me and the most heinous criminal. No different whatsoever. I used to tell guys when I was doing prison ministry, the big difference between me and you is you got caught. So folks... If we're not mindful of these things, we can and we do kind of sit back and smugly think, well, man, I'm sure glad I'm not like them. I'm so glad I don't act like that person. I don't do those things. We could fall into that. The Pharisees had. They were full of self-righteousness. So it's in this that I believe that God is wanting us to, to, he wants to help us to understand the issue is not what you do. The issue is who you are on the inside, who you are in the heart. Jesus goes on in verse 22, he says, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So when's the last time you said to somebody, Raka? <laughs> probably not you might not have used that word but I'll guarantee you that you have said something similar I have this is very convicting to me as I'm preparing this I'm like oh Lord I gotta give this message this is just cutting me up but it's a word that speaks of derision it's a word that speaks of malicious slander it's like calling somebody a numbskull or a lame brain or an idiot the word literally translates empty-headed. I remember years ago I taught in Matthew, and I, I related that to being an airhead. But the point is, and we use other adjectives to describe this, but the point here, Jesus is talking about slandering another. He's talking about assassinating someone's character. Those who would slander their brother are guilty, he says, the text says, before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, now, that's the Sanhedrin. Again, that group of 70 men who tried the most serious offenses, they passed the most severe penalties, including death by stoning. They had that right. The Romans executed by crucifixion. The Jews had the ability to execute by stoning. He says this, he says, and whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. 
Now, the word fool here is an interesting word. It's more. It's where we get the word moron. So he says, you want to call, call somebody a moron? That will get you to hell. Really, Pastor John? Yeah, really. It's not my words. These are Jesus' words. He's going somewhere with this. Understand that when Jesus, because Jesus called people a fool at times, but you've got to understand that when he did that, he was describing that person's true character. He could see their heart. He could see their life. We can't do that. We don't have that ability. We can't see the heart. But understand that here we're talking about abuse. We're talking about going to a point where anger begins to well up inside of me and I begin to slander my brother or my sister. Are you guilty? of that. I do it so much that I begin to condemn his character, tear him down with my words. Jesus says those people are guilty of fiery hell. And the word there is Gehenna. The Jews of that day would know it, uh, it was a reference to the Valley of Gehenna, or uh, formerly in the Old Testament, the Valley of Hinnom, the southeast side, southwest side, I'm sorry, of the old city of Jerusalem. It was used as a city dump. In that dump, everything from trash to discarded human remains would continually burn there. They used sulfur to burn. Brimstone, that's what it was called back then. Fire, smoke, stench permeated the place. It was identified in the minds of the people who were listening as a dirty, filthy, rotten a cursed place. Jesus uses it metaphorically here. I told someone once, I said, you know, when Jesus talks about hell, he wasn't talking about the dump. Something a whole lot worse. But he uses it metaphorically here. He uses it 11 times to describe eternal torment, separation from God. So he says, listen, you've heard that it was said by them of old, Just don't do the act. Then you're okay. Then you can be righteous. Then he goes on. He says, but I say to you that if in your heart you're angry with your brother, you're a murderer. So by this time again, you're thinking, "Uh, that makes me guilty. Correct. All of us. And I hope that that's your attitude. Because with the Pharisees that Jesus was addressing in this, That was not their attitude. They were smug, stuck in their own thing, thinking they had it all wired, totally missing that their hearts were corrupt before God. So that leads us to thinking about and looking at what needs to take place in my life so that I'm not a murderer. So for the answer to that, we've got to look even deeper. So we've seen that anger is the root of murder. Now this is, we're peeling the onion, we're peeling the layers back. Now we look at, we have to recognize the root of anger. Jesus has this to say in Mark chapter 7, verse 20, he says, it says, and he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. Defiles means dirty, makes him dirty. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, Thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. He goes on. All of these things, the point is, they proceed from within. All of these things proceed from the heart. And that is what defiles a man. That's Jesus, what he's saying. He's saying, look, recognize what causes anger. Do you understand? Do you know what causes anger? Simply put, the depravity of man. Simply put, the nature of Adam. Once there's a recognition of our condition, we have some decisions to make, don't we? How do I apply this to my life? In Colossians chapter 3, Paul the Apostle, he exhorts, he's making a strong exhortation to the church at Colossae. In verse 8, he says, but now you yourselves are to put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. What's the old man? 
the nature of Adam. Paul is saying, everything that makes you a murderer, get it out of your life. Take it off. Throw it away. Get rid of it. I love that he's, Paul says in, in Romans, he says, mortify the deeds of the flesh. What does that mean? It means you strangle that thing to the ground and you beat it till it's dead. That's what mortify means. It is a very active word. And yeah, we don't literally do that, but that's the attitude of the heart that we need to have in order to see that these things are things that are manifest in all of our lives and there is something we can do about it, but we can't do it without God's empowering. It's not about becoming a better person. That's religion. It's about yielding as the Spirit of God convicts you for your sin. Helps you to realize the consequences of these devastating attitudes. And all of us us have them. All of us can find ourselves slipping into them. Folks, it is a destroyer of the church. It's a destroyer of fellowship. When we become focused inward and we begin to pick at one another, be careful. Allow the Spirit of God to convict your heart. Allow him to work in you, to bring you to a place of humbly acknowledging your sin before him, asking him to forgive you, and then take care of it. We're going to talk about that. getting ahead of myself here. That leads us to how? How do we apply these things to our lives? How do we understand where to go from here? Lord, I see it. I see my depravity. I see where I fall short. Do I, so I don't want to just wallow in that place. There's good news. It's about being reconciled. Initially, being reconciled to God through the work of the cross. And reconciled to one another. Back to Matthew chapter 5. He says in verse 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. He says if you remember that your brother has something against you, that's implying that you remember that your brother has a valid something against you because of something you've done or an attitude that you've held. You need to go take care of that. You need to be reconciled. God gives us a way out. And I want to just be straight up with you. This is beautiful, and it's hard. It's hard. It requires real humility, and it grieves me. Folks, we can come to church with anger, unresolved bitterness, conflict, and actually think that we can come and worship God. According to this, according to Jesus' words here, God says you can't do that. Go and make it right. Well, and you might be thinking, well, what if I go and make it right and they don't receive it? You've done your part. That's okay. You need to be able to let go of it and trust God with that thing. But the point here is, have you done that? The point is, where is your life? If, if the Spirit of God is putting his hand on something, and I do not know what's going on in your life. I know what's going on in mine. I know the areas that I've been having to come to the Lord as I've studied this out. I told David this morning before service, this is a hard lesson. But you know, it's one that the church needs to hear. Have you done it? I want to remind you that it is always the Christian's responsibility to take the initiative for reconciliation. Always. Understand that. Verse 25, he says, agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have paid to the last penny. In other words, this is a debt that you have no ability to pay. Because how can you pay off a debt if you're in prison? 
And, and, and Jesus puts it that way, I believe, on purpose because all of us have a debt that there is no ability for us to pay. We throw ourselves upon the mercy of God. We ask God to, to cover us with his grace because there's no other way that we can come. So the progression here is this. Murder has at its root anger. Anger has at its root the nature of Adam, our fallen nature. Yet there's hope. For Jesus comes as the second Adam. We're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, for if by one man's offense, talking about Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, notice it's a gift, it's not something you earn, the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. He came to set it straight. So we either spend our lives walking out and, and expressing the nature of Adam in our lives, but now there's a new nature that, that is available to every person that comes through acknowledging the work of the cross in my life, that he died for these, these attitudes of my heart, that he died because he wanted to make a new creation. And through recognizing the work of the second Adam, things have been set straight. Am I willing to cooperate with that? Understand, if a holy God who never sinned took the initiative, reconciled with people like you and me who are utterly sinful, how much more should we go to our brother, to our enemy, to our opponent, and do all that we can to reconcile with that brother or that enemy that we might somehow give them a picture of Jesus living in me, in you? Folks, it's about the heart. It's only about the heart. It's not about the outward action. It's in these things that we love to say around here that we're learning to think like Jesus. It's in these things that that, that process is fully engaged. Don't leave here this morning bummed out because perhaps the Lord has laid open some things in your heart, in your life, we're going to come to the Lord's table here in a moment. Do business with him. Take care of those things. And if out of that you need to go to someone, be reconciled, if out of that you need to take care of some business, then fine, take care of that. But don't come to his table as a ritual, as an outward thing. Because what it reflects is something that happens deep in our hearts through acknowledging the work that was done on our behalves. <sighs> Scott, Gary, could you guys come and pass out the communion elements? Thank you. Don't forget those guys. As they're passing out the elements, as I mentioned, I, I cannot I cannot teach a message like this without having to do business with the Lord myself. Because I fall into these attitudes sometimes. It's not about whether I have literally, physically murdered someone. It's about what's going on in my heart when I harbor bitterness towards someone, when I harbor anger, when I let it go on, when I simmer in that. Part of why the body of Christ works is if we keep short accounts with one another. Part of what makes my marriage work is I keep short accounts with my wife. Part of what makes my relationships with you work is we need to keep short accounts with one another. 
We live in, as I mentioned in, when I was doing the announcements this morning, folks, we live in a world that is getting darker by the moment. And we need to be pulled together. Part of what I'm going to be talking about and when I do this series uh, on, on what's happening in our world here in a couple of weeks is out of Jeremiah chapter 12. There's a powerful passage there. There, God, through Jeremiah, Jeremiah was, was kind of moping and he was like, oh, this is so hard, God. You know, he, he was <laughs> the weeping prophet and all that. And God comes to him and, and, he, and God rebukes him. And he says, Jeremiah, Jerry, <laughs> I like to call him Jerry when I'm studying. He says, Jeremiah, if you can't run with the footmen, what are you going to do when the horses show up? He goes on to Jeremiah and he kind of doubles down on his rebuke and he says, if you lie down in a land of peace when things are easy, what are you going to do in the floodplain or the thicket of the Jordan when you're in the heat of the battle? And folks, there is a place where I, and you know me, I am not here, I will not beat people up. But there's also a place of sobriety that we need to have in the church. The church needs to be wake, of waking up. We need to be absolutely sober-minded about the things in the world that are going on around us. Because until he comes, we are his representation on this planet. Very serious. Very sobering. So as I mentioned, if there are things in your life that the Lord has, and as I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on in your life. I know what's going on in mine. But if God has put his hand on something in your life, I want to invite you, take it to him. Be reconciled in that area of your heart with him. And if out of that there's reconciliation that needs to come with another, then do that. As the guys are finished passing that out, I want to uh, start here in Luke chapter 22. Picking it up in verse 14 here, the, the background here, it's the Last Supper. Jesus is in the upper room with his men. He's been giving them final instructions for he knows that by this time the next day he will have been to the cross and been laid in a tomb. We're told that when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. It was Passover. And he said to them with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Oh, how we look forward to that day. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So thinking about this, until this moment, the Passover meal had always been to look back and to commemorate God's past faithfulness in his deliverance of the children of Israel from the nation of Egypt. That's what Passover was. However, here... Jesus does something different. He changes it up. Because here he looks forward. In doing so, he prompts his people to look forward as well. Look forward to what? We look forward to eternity in the presence of Christ, in the presence of God. An eternity devoid of suffering, an eternity devoid of this flesh that drags us down this nature that, that pulls at us, an eternity that is filled with joy, filled with understanding. I hope that it's an eternity that we're, where we continue to progress, where we continue to learn, where he, as God reveals things to us that we, be, we gain understanding. We don't know, but we do know that Jesus looks forward here. It's what the Bible refers to as our blessed hope. Because we look forward in hope. And all of this mess has passed away. And we're in the presence of our Lord. 
That's a birthright of every child of God. If you don't know Jesus this morning, if you have not been born again to that living hope, do it today. Understand. So we're told here in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, that Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, as we consider the body of Jesus broken for us, Lord, as your word tells us that he became sin, that we could become the righteousness of God in him, knowing, Lord, there's no way we could produce our own righteousness, that we have to have his righteousness. And in that transaction, knowing that we get all of the righteousness we need for heaven. What an amazing, amazing thing that was accomplished on our behalf at the cross. Words are not adequate to describe our gratitude, our thanks. And yet that's what we have. Thank you, Lord, for the work of the cross. Thank you for Jesus' body being broken for us. Let's take the bread. Going on in verse 20 of Luke 22. Likewise also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. No longer would man relate to God on the basis of law. It was fulfilled. But now we come on the basis of grace, his unmerited favor given for any who would come, simply acknowledging that that work was done for me personally, for you personally. What an awesome, awesome thing that Jesus accomplished on our behalf. While we were yet sinners, stuck in those attitudes of the heart, lost our way, and walking as children in darkness, that while that was the pla- in place in our lives, that he died for me, he died for you, that he could rescue us from this crazy world that we live in and give us eternity. He's written eternity in our hearts, the Bible tells us. Let's pray. Father, as we consider the cup, as we consider your son coming down to this earth, taking the form of a man, growing up, representing you perfectly to the people, and being beaten, tortured, executed in in the cruelest manner possible, all of that for love, all of that for the work that you wanted to do in reconciling man to yourself. Lord, I I think of your word describing this as the gift of God. And Lord, we know your hand is outstretched. You offer that gift to every man, every woman. We pray, Father, that for those that don't know you, that they would receive that gift. For those that do, Lord, our hearts are full. We rejoice in the finished work of the cross, in the blood that was shed for us. In Jesus' name.